So uh, the title of the lecture is The Ideal Class Group. Um, so let me um, remind you what we talked about last time. So um, we studied uh, so-called strict equivalence classes. Of binary quadratic forms, so, well, integral uh, positive definite, um, a fixed discriminant, uh, D, which should be uh, congruent to zero or one mod four, um, and negative, uh, so that we do indeed have a positive definite. Or a definite one at least. Um, and we saw that this set of, uh, of strict equivalence classes uh, is finite. And we saw that using reduction theory. So we found a sort of a, a canonical representative in each equivalence class, the so called reduced form. And this is following Gauss's reduction algorithm. Um, so that's all not all well and good, but today we're going to be doing something different. Uh, um, so we'll give a totally different perspective. On this finite set. Which will elucidate a lot of um, a lot of the properties that we care about. It will be very um, very helpful for understanding this set of uh, strict equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms. And well, the idea is, well, the, the phenomenon is that you can basically linearize the problem. So instead of looking at something quadratic, uh, so quadratic forms over Z, you know, binary quadratic forms over Z, We'll pass over to something else, which will be some linear problem, some linear data over not z, uh, but um, some sort of uh, quadratic extension of z called the ring of integers in the number field uh, q adjoined square root of d. So the basic ansatz is that instead of looking at a degree two problem over the integers, we'll replace it by a degree one problem essentially over a slightly more complicated ring, which is a degree two extension of the integers. Um, uh, this is, of course, not a precise statement. And I also want to is issue a warning right at the beginning that, well, this, this imprecise description might make it seem like it's an instance of some general procedure. But uh, actually, this is very specific to the case at hand. If you replace z by some other ring or you try to go to more variables, then the correspondence we're describing just breaks, breaks down. So I'm describing something very special in particular here, which when it exists, which is only here basically, then it's really helpful. But you shouldn't get the idea that it's, um, yeah, that it's an instance of some general principle. Um, OK. Uh, ah. And one other word, um, this correspondence um, doesn't really exist. Well, if, if I really use the ring of integers, well, we'll talk about what the ring of integers is in a second. But to, to make this correspondence, um, uh, we're going to have to make a further assumption on D. So from now on, uh, we'll assume uh, so D, besides being congruent to 0, 1, mod 4 and being negative, we'll assume it's a fundamental discriminant. This is the, a bit of terminology. So that means that, uh, well, so uh, if D is congruent to 0, mod 4, then you want to ask that D divided by 4 is square free. And uh, if D is congruent to one mod four, uh, then you ask directly that D is square free. Um, so the situation where D has some square factors in it up to the four that it has to have in this case, 
um, is just slightly more, requires slightly more notation to take care of. It's not fundamentally, well, I don't know. You can make something like this work outside this case, but it's just much easier to restrict to this most basic case here. Yeah, Eleftherius. So in this theorem of Hegner that you gave us at the end of yesterday's lecture, and you said that the class number of D is equal to one only for nine values, you meant fundamental uh, discriminants, yes. right? Because we found some more in the tutorial which were not yes. fundamental. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, like yes. Eight. I was, yeah, and also there was, yeah, there was one other claim that I made. I, fortunately, I scratched it out, but yeah, I was, in, I was implicitly only thinking about fundamental discriminants at some point, although I hadn't formally introduced that convention. Thank you so much. I'm happy you guys found the, uh, the uh, mistake there. Thank you very much. And I'm happy, very happy to hear that you guys worked through that and, um, and discovered that. Yes. Um, yeah, my mistake. Just, um, Okay, so I, so it should have been maybe this convention should have been even introduced in the previous lecture, but it was sort of irrelevant to everything I was literally discussing in the lecture, so I forgot about it. Um, okay, right. So now, um, ah, so well, what is the basic observation behind this correspondence here? So, and I'll give it in the our, well, our favorite simple case, d equals minus four, and our basic form x squared plus y squared. Well, the observation is that you can rewrite this expression, x squared plus y squared. Uh, well, you can um, recognize it as a difference of squares, uh, as long as you allow yourself to work, uh, as long as you give yourself a square root of minus one, right? So you can write this as x plus i y times x minus i y. Um, so here, I'll, I'll say x and z here, x, x and y here are integers. Um, so in other words, I could, I could say this is a t alpha times the conjugate of alpha, where alpha uh, is an element in the sort of integral analog of the complex numbers. So z bracket square root of, uh, z bracket square root of minus one, so z bracket i. Um, so if you want to picture, uh, you know, it's just, if you think of a complex plane as usual as R2, then this is just the standard lattice inside uh, the complex plane. Um, and there's another name for this expression, which is the norm of alpha. It's alpha times alpha bar. Um, so, in, so in other words, the numbers of the form uh, x squared plus y squared are the same as the uh, norms of elements of z bracket i. Oops, I went off the screen, sorry about that. So maybe I should say explicitly, this is just the set of all x plus i, y with x and y in the integers. Um, yes. And actually already this observation tells you something. Um, so there's a corollary here, which is not quite obvious from the beginning. So the, this set of numbers is closed under multiplication. Um, well, that's because this expression, alpha times the conjugate of alpha, that expression is obviously multiplicative in alpha. If you have alpha beta times alpha bar beta bar, well, complex conjugation is an automorphism. It commutes with multiplication and multiplication is commutative. So you can move things around and you get um, the, the norm is a multiplicative function. So norm of alpha beta equals norm of alpha, norm of beta. And that's not obvious. I mean, it's not obvious, I think, that if you take the product of two numbers of the form x squared plus y squared, it's also of the form x squared plus y squared. Of course, you can unwind this and figure out the algebraic identity that makes that true. So I guess like x squared plus y squared times z squared plus w squared is equal to, uh, yeah, kind of say, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, something or another. You could just do the, <laughs> do the product in the, just unwind what it says, you'll find some algebraic identity which proves that uh, a sum of a product of sum of two squares is also a sum of two squares. Um, uh, but you know, you, so you have, maybe you have to be a little clever to discover this, but if you, I don't know, well, maybe you have to be clever to discover this too, but 
Uh, the point is that this new perspective can make things which looked ad hoc and complicated can make them look rather natural instead. So this idea of passing to a quadratic extension. Um, so that's the kind of basic observation is that quadratic forms uh, arise from norms, norm functions. Um, so now we're going to um, we're going to now look at this from a, a more systematic perspective. Um, so, yes. So again, so D again will be a fundamental uh, discriminant, and it's negative as always. Um, and we're going to let uh, K denote the field you get um, from the rational numbers by adjoining the square root of D. Um, so it's just, I guess, the set of numbers of the form a plus b square root of d, uh, where a and b are rational numbers. Um, so this is a degree two field extension of the rational numbers. Um, so you know, there's addition and multiplication, and they work just like you think. You just multiply or add these expressions together and simplify. Um, and there's a, it's actually a Galois extension, um, degree two extension, which is Galois, and the uh, the automorphism uh, is, you know, uh, the unique non-trivial automorphism is denoted alpha goes to alpha bar, and it just sends a plus b square root of d. Uh, it, it switches the square roots of d that you have, right? So this will go to a minus b square root of d. Um, you can also, if you like, think of this inside the complex numbers, right? Um, so d, d is a negative number, but its square root is a complex number, and we can view this set, instead of thinking as it as an abstract thing, we can view it as a subset of the complex numbers. And then this really is just induced by your you know, you know, usual complex conjugation on the complex numbers. Um, OK. Um, now, what do we want? We want a subring uh, called OK subset K, which should be as analogous as possible. Uh, to you know, the integers sitting inside the rational numbers. Um, and that will be called the ring of integers of the of k. And so the um, well the I guess the theorem which gives characterizations. So you let uh, alpha in k, then the following are equivalent. Um, so the first, uh, I'll write them all and then I'll make some comments. Um, we're not going to completely prove this theorem, but I'll make some comments that will maybe elucidate some aspects of it. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the subring generated, generated by alpha uh, inside K. Uh, so just take all polynomials in alpha. Uh, inside k um, with the integer coefficients. Um, uh, this should be finitely generated as an abelian group, so as a z module. Um, the second condition uh, would be that alpha is the root of a monic polynomial. Monic means. Um, leading coefficient equal to one uh, with integer coefficients. Um, well, the third condition says, well, okay, uh, that, that's very uh, abstract and everything, but we, you, can, you can just write down a polynomial with rash, rational coefficients, which alpha is the root of just sort of directly. So if you take the polynomial T minus alpha and then T minus alpha bar, note uh, that this actually lies in, uh, it's a polynomial, a degree two polynomial with rational coefficients because it's equal to uh, t squared minus alpha plus alpha bar t uh, plus alpha alpha bar. And both of these expressions are invariant under conjugation. Uh, so, um, 
So under, then the things which are invariant under conjugation lie in the, the ground field, the rational numbers. Of course, you can also just, I mean, nice thing about quadratic fields is any abstract claim that I make, you can actually just sit down and check it concretely, right? You can, you can just calculate alpha plus alpha bar for any a plus b square root of b and just see, yes, indeed, it lies in the rational numbers. And same for alpha times alpha bar. So, um, you don't have to believe the abstract Galois theory explanation. Um, you can just check it yourself using the definitions. Um, so that lies in uh, QT. That's not the third condition. That's always satisfied for any alpha. Uh, but the condition is that this polynomial actually lies uh, in Z bracket T. Or in other words, I guess it's saying the same thing, uh, that both the trace of alpha and the norm of alpha are integers. Where the trace is the word for alpha plus alpha bar, and the norm is the word for alpha times alpha bar. Okay. So, why is this the definition of what it means to be? Ah, sorry. Uh, then, I, then I should say um, uh, the set of such of alpha satisfying these conditions. Is, uh, it is our definition of uh, the ring of integers. So an alpha satisfying these conditions is called an integral element of K and the set of integral elements is called the, the ring of integers. Um, so why are these, why is this a good definition of um, what it means to be an integral element? Well, actually in my, in my opinion, the most intuitive one is maybe the first one. I don't know why I think this, but I don't, uh, so we're trying to say that you don't have any denominators in some intuitive sense for your element alpha. And what, what happens when you have a denominator? Think of like a rational number that has maybe a five in the, denom uh, five in the denominator. When you take powers of that, the denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You get a worse and worse denominator, right? And then there's no way they could all live in the same finitely generated Z module because if you choose any finite number of them, there'll be some bound on the amount of fives that can occur in the, you know, the power of five that can occur in the denominator. Um, it wouldn't keep growing without bound. If it grows without bound, then, it, you know, the subring is not going to be finitely generated. So that, so, so the analog of this does characterize the integers inside the rational numbers. And it, in my mind, captures some intuitive sense in which the denominator, there can't be any denominators because the denominators would get, would get worse as you replace alpha by its powers and then would have to be infinitely generated. So I like, I like this condition. And then these, there's an obvious appearance of a condition that something which is a priori a rational number is actually an integer. Um, so that kind of makes sense too. Um, from in my mind, a little bit less convincing than number one, but still. Um, so then why are all these conditions equivalent? Well, I'm not gonna give a, the proof, like I said, but I do wanna just say a, a, a thing or two. But first of all, well, for one implies two, for example, I mean, you can look at, all the powers of alpha, and then there has to be some relation between them um, because it's finitely generated. But with a little extra argument, you can see that in fact, the relation has to be of the form that alpha to the n is equal to, is in the span of some previous set of uh, alpha to the n minus one and n minus two and so on and so forth. And that will exactly give you a root of a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. And that three implies two is just obvious. Here is a monic polynomial with integral coefficients and alpha is evidently a root. Um, what about two implies three? Oh yeah, and going two implies one is right. So it's the, then yeah, that, yeah, once you hit the power of alpha equal to the degree of the polynomial that your alpha satisfies, then you're in the span of the previous ones. So you're generated by all the previous ones. Um, so one is equivalent to two and why does three imply why does two imply three? If you're a root of some polynomial, why do you have to be a root of this one? Well, I guess you can argue that if alpha is the root of some monic polynomial with integer coefficients, then it's minimal polynomial has to have integer coefficients. And then the minimal polynomial divides, yeah, well, yeah, you have to do some sort of argument here. Um, and then I guess these are, uh, this is just three prime is just a rewriting of three. Um, Okay, uh, so, uh, so it's not obvious that okay, 
uh, forms a, a ring, i.e. is closed under addition and multiplication. Okay. To be a ring, you also need to be closed under a negation, but actually it is obvious that this is closed under a negation. Um, uh, but it's not obvious that it's closed under either addition or multiplication. Um, but it's, uh, it, you know, it is true um, and kind of on, on somewhat general grounds as well. But again, in the case of quadratic fields, you can actually just check this by hand. In fact, on your problem set, uh, you'll explicitly describe uh, uh, OK. And in fact, what you'll see is that um, OK is a free Z module of rank two uh, with generators. Uh, so one and square root of D over two, uh, if D is congruent to zero mod four and one, uh, and then I guess, well, there's, there, of course, there's some freedom in choosing these generators, right? Like, but uh, here's a particularly nice set of generators. Um, one and then uh, one minus square root of d over two if d is congruent to one mod four. And then once you've, and you can, you, you, you can prove this by just, um, you know, writing alpha as x plus square root of dy and just looking at what these conditions mean about those two rational numbers, alpha, uh, x and y that appear there and just analyzing the possibilities. Um, and then once you've explicitly described, okay, you can just check by hand that it's closed under. Well, it's actually it's clear from this that it's closed under addition, but then you check by hand that it's closed under multiplication. So you just have to multiply this by itself and see that it's in this in the set. Uh, it's a linear combination of these two. Um, right. Yeah. Yes, Eleutherius. And because I'm when I looked at this square root of d over two, I kind of thought about those primitive polynomials that you that you mentioned yesterday and you said there's something special about them will they be norms like x squared plus y squared was a norm of something well, are they also going to be norms of stuff congratulations you predicted the very next thing i'm going to say so uh, <laughs> sorry about that no no i'm very happy uh um right so yeah what so what does it mean that ox is the free z module of rank two on these generators it means that every alpha and ok is uniquely of the form, uh, you know, x plus square root of d over two y uh, with x and y integers in the first case, or alpha is x plus one minus square root of d over two y uh, in the second case. Um, and now let's, yeah, let's follow up on Alferios' uh, comment. So, yeah, so what is then the norm of alpha in the first case? So in case one, the norm of alpha, well, you just calculate it. You multiply alpha by its conjugate. So you take x plus square root of d over 2y, multiply by x minus square root of d over 2y, and um, you get uh, x squared minus dy squared. Uh, and in the second case, uh, you do the same thing, and you get x squared plus xy uh, uh, plus 1 minus d over 4y squared. So these were exactly. our fundamental uh, uh, forms of discriminant D. So already, I guess, from this, um, this theory of uh, quadratic fields and ring of integers, we recovered, well, at least the most prominent of the binary quadratic forms of discriminant D. Um, what about all the other ones? Well, we're going to get there. Um, but before we get there, um, I want to do two preliminaries just to set us up. Yes, Eleutherios. In the case of d equal to 0 mod 4, should it not be minus d over 4? Uh, why? Just, squared? I don't know why. I, I don't know why I got it wrong in my notes, first of all, and then why I didn't catch it when I was writing it here. Thank you. So I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eleutherios, for your comments um, and corrections. Um, yes, it should be d over four. Um, uh, right. 
So we're just going to do a couple of preliminaries, and one of the preliminaries will have to do with the theory of uh, well, th this norm function, and the other preliminary will have to do with the theory of binary quadratic forms, and then we'll meet in the middle, right? Um, so, uh, so, two preliminaries. So, one uh, about the norm. Um, so, it's going to be our most important function for this lecture. So, I think it pays to give. Um, you know, several different perspectives on it. Uh, so, well, first of all, I should maybe say that it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it actually lands in the non-negative integers. Um, well, we just said it's, it's give, given by these positive definite binary quadratic forms, so that follows, but it's also alpha alpha bar for some alpha in the complex numbers. So it's the absolute value of alpha squared. Um, so the, there are two different ways of, I guess, seeing it. Um, uh, right, so lemma. So let alpha in OK. Then norm of alpha, well, it's equal to alpha alpha bar. I already said that. Um, but it's also equal to the determinant of multiplication by alpha from OK to itself. And um, well, this is a, well, this, rem remember that this is a free Z module of rank two. Um, so, I have a, and I have a, a, this multiplication map is a linear map. So I'm getting a linear map from a free module of rank two to a free module of rank two. It's given by some two by two matrix. And I take the determinant of that. And it's independent of the choice of basis. So the choice of isomorphism with Z direct sum two. Um, because yeah, because determinant is uh, invariant under change of basis. Um, so determinant makes sense for an abstract endomorphism of a free module of finite rank. So we're applying it to this particular endomorphism of free module of rank two. Um, now, that's not too difficult to show, but the next one is, I think, very interesting. It gives a completely different expression for the norm. It says it's actually a good measure of the, the, the size of alpha. Um, so it's the same thing as the number of uh, residue classes of OK modulo alpha. Um, So this is a, so, so this OK mod alpha OK. Well, I'm taking OK modulo, the ideal of OK generated by alpha. So this is just the set of residue classes of OK uh, mod alpha. So you identify two elements of OK if they differ by a multiple of alpha, meaning if they're of the form alpha times beta, where beta lies in OK. And you ask how many how many you get. Um, okay, so let me give a little example, first of all. So suppose alpha is actually equal to an integer. So the, the usual integers sit inside okay, right? Um, uh, so we can calculate all of these expressions. So well, the, norm of, the norm of k is equal to k times k bar, but, but k is fixed by this, so that's k squared. I mean, yeah, k is fixed by conjugation, so that's k squared. Um, and the multiplication by k map from OK to OK is diagonal with entries uh, kk. So the determinant is also k squared. So that's good. And then uh, OK mod, oh no, and now I realize, of course, that k was a, a very uh, terrible choice for uh, an integer when my quadratic field is also denoted k. I'm going to switch. OK, so up till this point, I hope it hasn't caused too much confusion. But now I'll switch to n. OK mod n OK. Um, so this is Z direct sum itself modulo n times Z direct sum itself. Uh, so that's that's Z mod n Z direct sum Z mod n Z. So that also has size uh, yeah, n squared. So it all kind of kind of checks out. Um, so has the size absolute value of n squared really, but that's the same as n squared. Um, yeah, so it checks out there. Um, 
Right. So what about the, uh, so why is it true in general? Well, so why is alpha alpha bar equal? Well, again, you, you can just calculate. Yeah, we gave a basis for OK. So you can just write, write alpha in terms of coordinates for that basis, calculate the determinant of this matrix, note that it equals this quantity here, no problem. But there's also a good abstract reason why this first equality holds. It's um, to calculate a determinant, you can base change to whatever uh, field you like, as long as that field contains your, your ring. And if you base change to the complex numbers, then uh, you'll find that you can write this as a diagonal matrix with entries alpha and alpha bar. Um, you can choose a different basis. Uh, so that, that explains this. And, and the second, the last equality is, is much more interesting. Um, and I want to give a little picture, which, I th which is a, a proof, right? It's kind of a geometric proof of this. So recall uh, that, well, the absolute value of the determinant of a map is the uh, factor by which areas are scaled. Uh, when you apply your transformation. So that's the kind of geometric interpretation of the determinant. Um, so now we have kind of sitting inside the complex numbers here, oh, uh, complex numbers. We have OK, which is some lattice. Um, uh, and then we have alpha times OK, which is going to be some, uh, some bigger lattice, right? Uh, and how much bigger is it? Well, we can take a, a fundamental rectangle for OK, uh, just spanned by the basis vectors that we had. Um, and when we multiply by alpha, we know that the area of this fundamental rectangle is going to grow by the factor equal to the determinant of alpha. Um, but then what is OK mod alpha times OK? So alpha OK is the sub lattice. Then you're going to see uh, that the integer points inside this uh, blown up parallelogram you get by multiplying by alpha uh, are exactly giving you the residue classes. So then you use the fact that the number of integer points in a parallelogram is the same as the area of the parallelogram because to every integer point you have a copy of the, uh, you make a copy of the parallelogram. So you just choose the corners, uh, so to speak. Um, so um, this is, yeah, this is not supposed to be a convincing argument. Um, it's maybe something to ponder at home. <clears throat> so if you imagine, yeah, you just like a fundamental parallelogram for OK, hit it, hit it by multiplication by alpha, you've got a fundamental parallelogram for alpha times OK. And then I claim that the integer points inside that fundamental parallelogram uh, exactly give you the residue classes mod alpha. So this is similar to, you could do a similar picture for the integers, right? You take the integers and you scale them up by three. Uh, and then you look at the integer points inside that fundamental interval, and those are the residue classes modulo three. Um, okay, so uh, right. So let's um, so let's take this lemma and note an interesting consequence. Um, so corollary. So if. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said non-zero, uh, a non-zero element of OK. It, you know, I mean, for the first two equalities don't require alpha to be non-zero, but the last one does, because when alpha is equal to zero, um, uh, this is infinite, right? Um, so, uh, right. Uh, so now I've... Uh, Uh, so if you have any non-zero ideal in OK, so that means that uh, I is a, a Z submodule, well, an OK submodule. So it, it's closed under addition and closed under multiplication by alpha for all alpha in OK. Um, so that's, I'm just reminding you what an ideal is. Um, then OK mod I uh, is finite. Um, and um, well, the proof is, I guess, pretty simple. So if I is non-zero, then we can choose a, a non-zero alpha inside I. And then 
well, then the ideal generated by alpha, so alpha times OK, uh, will be inside I, inside OK. And then so OK mod alpha OK will surject onto OK mod I. It's a finer, OK mod I is a finer quotient than OK mod alpha OK. So since this is finite, this will also be finite. And um, well, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. That's a preliminary to what I want to talk about. Um, is that we can extend the norm function to non-zero ideals or to ideals. Um, so, um, so its definition: uh, if i not equal to zero is an ideal, and okay, uh, then. Define the norm of the ideal to be the number of residue classes modulo that ideal. And so, so our lemma uh, says the same thing as saying that if you take the norm of the so called principal ideal, the ideal generated by the element alpha, that's the same thing as the norm of alpha. Um, so uh, yeah, so in, the, in this sense, the no notion of norm of elements can be extended to the notion of norms of ideals. Um, and here's a non-trivial fact, uh, which is important. Uh, if you take the product of two ideals, uh, then the norm of the product is the same thing as the product of the norms. And uh, what does, so what does this mean? Uh, this is the, um, uh, the uh, this means the ideal generated by the alpha times beta for alpha and i and beta in j. So you take all pairwise products and then you might have to close it under sums. Uh, so in other words, uh, yeah, it's also just the abelian group generated by alpha times beta um, for alpha and i and beta in j. Um, and let me just remark that this is consistent with the previous multiplicativity property of the norm, because uh, if you take alpha OK times beta OK, uh, that is indeed alpha beta OK. So the product of norms is, um, is compatible with the product of, of elements. Um, OK. So that was. Uh, Um, that was a little preliminary about norms. Um, yes, Eleutherius. So looking at this multiplicativity of norms, that would technically enable us, in theory at least, to compute the norm of any ideal, right, by unique factorization. Yes, I I guess. Uh, th yeah, this is a good way to go. Uh, we have we're not going to be we're not talking about prime ideals and unique factorization yet though that'll come in um maybe tomorrow um but uh but yes this is going to be an, a very important fact moving forward as well because of this thing called unique prime factorization of ideals um right so um now the second preliminary Uh, is the basis free uh, approach to strict equivalence of binary quadratic forms. Um, so uh, if you have a binary quadratic form, uh, You can view it as a function from uh, you know, the standard free Z module of rank two uh, to Z. Uh, so this is just coordinatized with X and Y. So X is, will be the first coefficient of the first you know, the first factor and Y will be the second factor. And this is a quadratic form uh, in the abstract sense. So this uh, F of uh, you know, lambda X equals lambda squared f of x and f of x plus y minus f of x minus f of y is bilinear. 
Um, now, yeah, yeah, now, yeah, I should be careful because now, I mean, X is now supposed to be an element of this thing. So maybe for clarity, I should denote it by something else like uh, M, so little M, uh, M plus N, M, N, yeah. So uh, M is in Z direct some Z. Um, but the notion, so there, there's a, a standard notion of now that we're in this abstract language, so we can abstract this to a map from a free Z module of rank two. Um, and we can just write down the same definition of what it means to be a quadratic form. And now we've got a basis free notion of a quadratic form, which we already discussed. But the notion of isomorphism between basis free quadratic forms, the natural notion is that you have to give yourself an isomorphism of abelian groups, which makes the diagram commute, right? So you have your f and your f prime, and you should give an isomorphism alpha so that if you do alpha and then f prime, it's the same as doing f. Um, that natural isomorphism, uh, so that uh, corresponds to not strict equivalence, but usual equivalence of uh, you know, f, x, y's. So uh, i.e. up to GLNZ, uh, GL2Z, uh, not SL2Z. Because um, yeah, it's an arbitrary, just an arbitrary invertible. If you put coordinates on these, which is how you go backwards, then it's just an arbitrary invertible thing. So um, to get something that corresponds to um, we'll consider oriented uh, free Z modules of rank two uh, equipped with a quadratic form. So, um, and an orientation on a free Z module of rank two, you can read it on the um, corresponding real vector space of dimension two. So it's just, um, it's just giving an orientation on that real vector space. So clockwise, like sort of a notion of counterclockwise or a notion of clockwise or whatever. And that's because, you know, to go from GL2 to SL2, it's equivalent to giving, given an element of GL2, to say it's an SL2 is the same thing as saying, if you view it as a real matrix, then it has positive determinant. Um, so you can read it off the data on real numbers, usual notion of orientation on the real numbers. Um, but then when you do this, um, uh, uh, then to every uh, binary quadratic form, there corresponds a oriented uh, free Z module of rank two uh, uh, with a quadratic form on it. So this is just some naive expression, right? Fxy is ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared. Um, uh, and strict isomorphisms or strict equivalences uh, between binary quadratic forms exactly match up with isomorphisms of oriented uh, well, isomorphisms of these guys. So it's just isomorphisms as before, which have the extra property that they respect the orientation. So um, they respect all the data. And you can also go backwards. So for every oriented free Z module of rank two, if you choose an oriented basis, so a basis where it goes counterclockwise or goes according to the orientation, um, then when you write it in coordinates, you'll get a binary quadratic form. And so it will be such that the oriented free Z module of rank two you associate to that is, is isomorphic to the one you started with. So, um, so we have a correspondence sort of on objects and on equivalences. And um, so, if you if you want to use fancy language, uh, so you actually have an equivalence of groupoids, so-called equivalence of groupoids. Yeah. 
So there's a groupoid of binary quadratic forms where the, the objects are binary or expressions of this form and the isomorphisms are uh, changes of variables with determinant one. That's a, a very concrete groupoid where you just have concrete objects and concrete maps. And then we have this abstract groupoid where an object is an oriented free Z module of rank two equipped with a quadratic form in this abstract sense. And the isomorphisms are the, the just the maps, per, you know, iso, the bijections preserving all the structure. Those two groupoids are equivalent. So in particular, uh, isomorphism classes are the same. So, uh, and also when you fix the discriminant. So our strict equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms of discriminant D can also be understood in the abstract language. Um, you also get that the automorphisms are the same. So these special orthogonal groups of binary quadratic forms are just the automorphisms of the objects in this groupoid here. So um, you can see them abstractly as well. And it's just gonna be more convenient for your, your dear lecturer. Uh, I'm not claiming it's more convenient for you, I'm just, just for me to, to, to work in this abstract language here because I get confused when I write down formulas and it's harder for me to get confused when I'm dealing with abstract data. That's just me. Um, so we're gonna, uh, so instead of giving a correspondence between binary quadratic forms up to strict equivalence with linear algebraic data, which I'll explain, we'll give an uh, equivalence with, with this kind of thing here. And to make it concrete, you have to choose a basis for your for your um, free Z module of rank two, but I don't want to choose a basis because it's kind of, I think it obscures the picture. Um, okay, so, so for example, uh, if you just take OK and this norm function, this fundamental thing we had, uh, this is an oriented, well, it is a, an abstract uh, binary quadratic form. Um, so it is, a, it is a quadratic map from this free Z module of rank two to Z. Um, and we can orient it uh, by, uh, well, Let's use the standard orientation on the complex numbers uh, if D is congruent to zero mod four and the opposite if D is congruent to one mod four. There's no special significance to this choice. Uh, seems a little funny, <coughs> but it just happens to correspond to on the basis I wrote down earlier for this free Z module of rank two to saying that that basis has the correct orientation. So if you just look at those two basis vectors and ask what orientation they're in, they're in the standard orientation of D is zero mod four and opposite of D is one mod four. So that's just how it worked out. Um, but there's no special significance to this convention of how we orient OK. Um, OK, so that uh, that is what corresponds to our principal forms or the strict equivalence class of our principal forms now has this canonical abstract representative. Um, and now I wanna say how to generalize. So how to get all forms. Um, so here's the definition. Uh, let I uh, inside OK be a non-zero ideal. Um, define uh, f uh, from i to z by uh, f of alpha. We take the norm of alpha, but then we recognize that there's a common, there's a sort of a, a common factor to all of these norm of alpha expressions, namely the norm of the ideal itself. So we divide by that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so this, yeah, so this uses uh, that since alpha is inside I, that implies that alpha OK uh, uh, is a sub ideal of I. And then there's a non trivial fact that if you have a sub ideal, uh, then um, uh, uh, 
Oh, right. Then you're a, then you have to be a product of I with some other ideal J. So this is also non-trivial. Um, right. Uh, so, and we will orient I uh, as before. So, uh, so the counterclockwise uh, in C, if D is congruent to zero mod four and opposite otherwise. Um, then let me state the theorem. Uh, yes, Eleftherius. I'm, I'm probably misunderstanding something, but wouldn't this definition of F that we're giving end up being constantly the norm of capital I? Because the norm of alpha by the thing you wrote in the parentheses, well, it's equal to the norm of the ideal generated by alpha, which is equal to I times I. So we would constantly be getting norm of I times I over norm of I, right? Oh no, this is a J, wait. Oh, it's J, oh, okay. So that I explains mean, it. Let's, let's take the case where I is equal to OK, so the unit ideal. Then the norm of I is one, and we're just getting our, our, our principal quadratic form that we had before. Um, I see, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what, what is the thing in the parentheses? Is that a justification that it's an integer? Yes, thank you, exactly. Oh. Wait, doesn't that just follow from OK over alpha? Oh, that's or one of them being a quotient of the other? Better, of course. Thank you so much. That's a much better argument. Yes, yes, yes. Let me explain what a, uh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't get your name. Was it Kenzo? Is it, uh, it's know. Kenta. Kenza, sorry. Yes. I just popped up on the screen briefly. Um, so let me give Kenza's argument instead, which is much better. Um, so, uh, Right, so we know that norm of alpha, why, why this is an integer. So norm of alpha is the number of residue classes mod alpha, and norm of i uh, is the number of residue classes mod i. Um, so, and uh, yeah, since alpha is in i, OK mod i is a further quotient of um, OK mod alpha. And so, um, yeah, so, I don't know what to say. Uh, the, this ratio will actually just be the same thing as the number of elements in the kernel of this. So that we're, in other words, the number of elements in, um, in I modulo the ideal generated by alpha. Um, so yeah. I, probably you were about to explain it better than me, Kenza. I, 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 well. <laughs> no, I um, think that was good. <laughs> Kenza, Kenza, sorry, yes. Uh, how did you say it? Oh, I, I just said it's a quotient, so it's just a factor. Uh, yeah, so, yeah it's a, um, so on number of elements, it's a factor. Yeah, so if you have a quotient of a group, Right, that's a good way of saying it. if you have a group and then you have some quotient of it, the, the order of that quotient group is always a divisor of the order of the group. And the, in, in fact, the thing, so if you take the order of the quotient and multiply by the order of the, the kernel, then that's equal. I guess it's essentially Lagrange's theorem, but yeah. Read in reverse, yeah, exactly. Lagrange's theorem read in reverse, um, I think. Yeah, Lotharius, you also have a question? Or a comment? Uh Oh, no, I just forgot my hand up, sorry. Oh, that's OK. Um, OK, so now let me state the main theorem, which uh, I guess we'll continue discussing next time. Um, so, uh, so uh, well, f is quadratic of discriminant d. So it's a quadratic form of discriminant d. Uh, the second thing is every quadratic form of discriminant D uh, is strictly a, uh, equivalent to some uh, so to one of these guys, one of these norm functions that I'm calling F. Maybe I should call it F sub I when I want to uh, stress the on I, 
Um, and the third thing is uh, for an abelian group isomorphism. So for a Z-module isomorphism. Uh, so phi from I to J. So if you have just an isomorphism of abelian groups from an ideal I to an ideal J, so the following are equivalent. Uh, so uh, condition A is that phi is an isomorphism uh, from this oriented quadratic form to uh, this oriented quadratic form. And the second condition is that uh, phi is an OK module isomorphism. So it commutes with the uh, scalar multiplication by OK. And the third condition is the concrete one. So, uh, so there exists an alpha in K, not OK, such that uh, phi is given by multiplication by alpha. So, so every quadratic form is strictly equivalent to one of these i's, one of these ideals with this norm form. But more than that, if you want to understand strict equivalences, so, you, so if you're only interested in quadratic forms up to strict equivalence, which we are, you might as well assume from the start that any quadratic form you have is exactly equal to one of these fi's, right? But then you still want to know when any two such are strictly equivalent, or more generally, what are all the strict equivalences between two such? And now this says it's a very simple linear condition, just commuting with the scalar multiplication by OK. So this is this linearization that I'm talking about. Well, I guess somehow, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, right, so in, I guess in the language of Groupoids, yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe I, maybe we're running out of time. So I'll, we'll take this up again next time. And I want to elucidate this statement a little bit more and, and, and get some consequences out of it, and as well as proving it, I suppose. Um, OK. Uh, sorry, uh, did you define orientation? Can you? Yeah, the, I always have trouble defining orientation. Um, I mean, I guess like I searched it up and it's just isomorphism with the highest exterior product, but like, I mean, I guess that makes sense, but. Oh yeah, so for a Z module, there's that trick, yeah? So it's a, you could say it's an isomorphism of the exterior power with the integers. So that's yeah. fairly, fairly nice. Yeah, um, I think, I guess that's easy to understand. But yeah, like the problem is we're, we're kind of using this, also using this observation that the notion of orientation only depends on the corresponding real vector space. Like when I just, I want to say that like, Orienting I and orienting OK are the same thing. And this is less obvious from the perspective of, like, if you give that purely Z module definition, that's a less obvious claim. Um, yes. uh, maybe it's not too hard to prove there's some square factor or something like showing up somewhere, but, um, but still, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, an orientation, but then you could say an orientation, if you like this abstract language, you could say an orientation is a choice of connected component of the top exterior power of your real vector space. Um, well, minus zero. Yeah, you take the top exterior power of the real vector space minus zero and choose a connected component. That's an orientation. Um, so E tensor of R? 
what? first? Oh, you tensor you, of R first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have a finite dimensional real vector space, you okay. can take an exterior power that's one dimensional. So when you remove the origin, it has two components. You could say an orientation is a choice of one of those two oh. components. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes a basis okay. of the up to positive scalars. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. That's so that only works if it's integers, because right. Uh which what only works if it's integers? Does that doesn't that definition only work for Z modules? Since which? that you tensor of R and so? Or does that work in general? Well, I mean, the notion of orientation is is um, kind of specific to the real numbers. Although I guess you could always define it as like a. I mean, maybe in the if you're thinking abstractly, uh, maybe you want to say that an orientation is like a. For a finite, for like a vector space over a field, maybe you want to say an orientation is a choice of ba uh, basis in the top exterior power up to squares or something like that. And then it makes sense for an arbitrary field. That's probably like the, I think for people doing like motivic homotopy theory, which isn't that what this whole thing is about? Uh, <laughs> this whole, I think they use that kind of definition. Um, uh, but I like classically speaking, the notion of orientation is for real vector spaces. Okay. Um, so, yeah. There is a somewhat of a concept that like our like undergraduate classes uh, we take it for granted without really giving a formal definition of what it means, right? Oh, it's like counterclockwise or clockwise. Oh, well, okay, what the heck does that mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very good question, and I don't really think I have a good answer. Um, okay. Oh, I thought the R vector space explanation was nice. If you like that, then, then yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eleferios, yes. On this uh, orientation discussion, just to, to kind of verify whether I get things right or not. So for the case where that we're working on right now, where we have like uh, rank two Z modules and we can, I guess, regard them as, uh, we can kind of take the real case, like the case of orientation of a real vector space and take that down to, to Z. So could we say that, like, I guess the kind of, more elementary definition that I'm probably familiar with would, would also work, right? That if I have a basis, then, and I, and I say that this basis has positive orientation arbitrarily, then any other basis has the same orientation if and only if the, the matrix that takes this basis to the other one has positive determinant. So that would be like the definition I keep in mind. That is a good definition, yes. So, yeah, indeed. So you can think of it as a, basis of the vector space up to some notion of equivalence. Um, you can think of it as, a, but then there's some of this more refined thing, the uh, basis of the top exterior power of the vector space up to a, uh, a different notion of equivalence. Like that's somehow, I think in some sense that's preferable um, because because like the definition is functorial for longer. I mean, I don't, what am I? Uh, uh, like there's less data in giving the a basis of the top exterior power. So the amount of equivalence you have to keep track of in your head is less for when you talk about the top exterior power first than if you talk about a basis, then it's up to a huge notion of equivalence. So positive, you know, any inner, uh, transformation with positive determinant, whereas when you pass the top exterior power, it's just positive scalars. Um, and then this top exterior power functor, it, you know, <laughs> court thing is a functor. So it like carries all the structure, anything you want along with it. And so that I think that's that's why um, that might be kind of preferable on abstract grounds. But yes, it's hard for me to decide which definition I prefer in general. It probably depends on the context. Um, yeah. Thank you. I mean, just to make a very small comment. I guess here we're only using the orientation, the notion of orientation for a two-dimensional object. So it really is sort of a notion of counterclockwise. But yeah, but what does that mean? Well, I mean, you could say that if you have two vectors, it, I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, it's saying. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a map which assigns to every pair of uh, linearly independent vectors a plus or a minus one. Well, I mean, of course, that's basically the same thing as what we, you know, yeah. or as what Elisirio uh, explained. We're giving the top exterior power, or we're giving a basis of the dual to the top exterior power. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, great. 
Yeah, but that's a, that's actually a, I like that definition a lot. So, yeah. But I mean, yeah, just say I mean, I, I guess it's essentially um, it's equivalent to what Eleutherio said. It's it's like you're giving you're partitioning the set of all bases of your vector space into two two classes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Yes, Alperos. I was also wondering, and this maybe goes back to the intersection of today's lecture with the with the previous one, because I mean, in that exercise we had the tutorial sheet it, for computing some some class numbers and finding some the the reduced forms in that x sub d. Like that was an exercise that I mean, for each integer that we had to work on, it was like fairly okay to to handle, and it was it, it was a bit. It was quite fun, to be honest. So I was wondering, like, has anybody undertaken this task, like make a table of those things or write a program or something where you can just, I'll give you a discriminant and. Surely many, many pro such programs exist. Yes, uh, I think Pari GP certainly, which is the only uh, program I've ever really used, although I haven't used it in some number of years, um, knows how to do this. Um, I don't know, maybe some do the TAs or, or Akil, um, do, are there favorite programs that people use nowadays? I mean, my knowledge of this kind of stuff is like 15 years old. Um, so not a, um, a specific program at the table, there's the LMFDB, um, which is just like a really large database of various sorts of number theoretic objects that people are interested in. It will tell you, you know, all about their various invariants. Um, so maybe most relevantly, they have like a section on number fields and you can look at number fields and then, all right, as we've like just seen every like number field has like some ring of integers and then attached to this ring of integers, you can like make sense of its discriminant. And so you can like go through here and then, um, yeah, just see lots of information about number theoretic objects. I don't think this one says anything like directly in the language of like binary quadratic forms. So maybe there are other resources uh, one could point to, but this, this is, I think, a good website to be aware of. Thanks, yeah, and the great thing about LMFTB is like, you can download stuff um, in multiple forms. So like you can download it for, to be used in like Magma, Sage at least, maybe Pari as well. Um, for, for quadratic orders, I know because I've needed it at some point, I think it's Mark Watkins has some huge list of like, where like, you know, he has some algorithm to just generate like all the orders up to like, I think he's gone up to like 100, but I think maybe somebody else has done it. Uh, maybe John Voigt, I might be wrong there for like assuming GRH for like a, a even larger bound and you can go in and use that stuff. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know if this is a Easy question to answer, but what do you gain if you assume GRH in this context? I forget the exact, um, I, I guess it's something about like you want to say that you your list of, let's just say like um, max, maximal orders of class number, like quadratic orders, imaginary quadratic orders of class number, like up to some bound is complete. Um, GRH comes in somewhere. I actually, I actually completely forget um, where it is. Okay. Does anyone, does anyone else know the answer to this? I could look into it. I mean, GRH doesn't that give us like corollaries about like prime number distribution? And I mean, that sort of thing has like implications basically everywhere, right? I'm guessing yeah. I'm guessing that would at least like let 
I'm, I'm guessing assume GRA to at the very least let someone like optimize the algorithm for determining it, right? I doubt this the person would be able to write that that much out by hand. Right. Um, I'll look for the exact paper. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm not sure of like the exact way that it it uh comes into play. Okay, thank you. And I think I have another another question again, just going through my notes. So we gave this convention about uh, how we uh, how we orient this this basis that we have, this kind of canonical basis that we have for the for the ring for the ring of integers for OK. We said that so near the end of the lecture, we talked about how we should orient OK. Now that that orientation was chosen to make sure that our canonical basis of OK is positively oriented, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I see. Thank you. I, I mean, canonical basis. I mean, the reason I chose that basis is is it the one that makes the norm form the reduced representative for that um, uh, strict for that um, strict equivalence class. Um, yeah, that's the reason I gave that basis specifically is because it's the one that matches up with the reduced representative. Now, this notion of um, reduced binary quadratic form, while beautiful and uh, and lovely and has great applications computationally and so on, it's not really canonical. I wouldn't say. I mean, it's kind of you all, you know. Uh, well, maybe it's I don't know. It, you could mess around with it a little bit, like instead of having b be greater than or equal to zero, you could ask b to be less than or equal to zero. I mean, I don't know. There's, it's not clear, except for convenience, it's not exactly clear in what sense the, um, that, per, that precise set of equivalence classes is canonical. I mean, I don't know, maybe it is, uh, uh, but yeah. Yeah, we are making choices, like for example, that saying that in the boundary cases, B is, is, is uh, non-negative. Exactly. But here's, here, that's, maybe that would be a, a question in, in my head. Why would it like have you have you encountered a case where it would be expedient to fiddle around with this definition? Like, I mean, I don't change so. those arbitrary decisions. Oh, I mean, but I don't because I think the only point is to be able to write down small representatives, and so if you could fiddle with it and choose a slightly different set of small representatives, but the purpose would be the same, and in particular, you wouldn't get anything more out of it. So everyone might as well just use the same one, right? Just to, or just have a convention. convention. Right? But when you go to higher dimensions, like from, go from SL2Z to SLNZ and so on, then there are, people have different choices they use for fundamental domains. And it's not, it's really much less obvious how to select a, a, a representatives for the set of the equivalence classes. Um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so in particular there, it's quite evident that there's nothing that's canonical in any sense, I think. Um, it's all just a, some convention.
So if, if there are no more questions, I will get to uploading everything and so on. Um, so see you guys later. <laughs>